Praise be Jesus Christ, and welcome back to Season 5, Episode 32 of CarmelCast, where we are continuing our study of the Way of Perfection by St. Teresa of Avila. CarmelCast is a production of the Institute of Carmelite Studies Publications. For more information, please visit our website at icspublications.org, where right now we're still underway with our Lenten sale, where you can save 30% on writings by and about St. Teresa of Avila. So please check that out and use promo code LENT30 at checkout to save 30%. And today I'm uh, blessed to be joined again uh, by Dr. Mary Ruth Hackett and Brother John Mary of Jesus Crucified. Thank you both for being back again as we undergo our fourth episode in this season uh, covering the way of perfection, chapters 22 through 25. Thank you. Yeah. It's great to be back. Yes. <laughs> so as always, we have been answering some questions every week that we receive via email and in the comments on YouTube. So again, we encourage you to use that function. Uh, if you have any questions at all about the way of perfection, um, about prayer in general, we'd be happy to answer those as we go along in the season um, and know that we're working on answering every question that we receive, even if we don't read them on the air. So thank you so much for your questions. But today we have a question uh, from Catherine who asked a question on our in the YouTube uh, comments for our last video, I believe. Um, and Catherine asks, I've read and heard many times about St. Teresa not being able to meditate without reading. I've never really understood what she meant by this. Could you explain? And what was her experience? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. To, even just to reflect over like what what was Teresa's experience of prayer and it's I think in the life uh, in the book of her life is where you can really find the answer to that question in particular um, it's she explains there how she struggled for 18 years in prayer through this trial of being unable to meditate and really how she used a book uh, to, to aid her meditation and so she's she writes in um, chapter 4 paragraph nine about this in, in the book of her life. And she said, said, I never dared to begin prayer without a book for my soul was as fearful of being without it during prayer as it would have been, should it had been, in, had been, had to battle with a lot of people with this recourse, which was like a partner or a shield by which to sustain the blows of many thoughts. I went about consoled. And I think that's, yeah, she shows us really how to pray with a book um, in that this idea of the book as kind of a shield for distractions. And so I, I envision what her experience was like if she was trying to sit in prayer. She you know would find her mind wandering all about like a bunch of wild horses, she says. And that's when she could pick up a book and begin to read a spiritual book, of course. And she writes in that same paragraph that um, sometimes she, just opening the book was enough. At other times, I read a little at other times, a great deal, according to the favor the Lord granted me. So this idea of even just opening the book can serve as a, a means to, to, to turn our wills and turn our minds back to God when we find our, our thoughts wandering. And that's something that we're going to talk about, I think, in this episode is distraction and distraction and prayer and really how to, how to handle that. But Teresa is a good example. So, I mean, I've, I think you'll find most of the people in the monastery typically have a book at their place in the chapel. And when sometimes you go through a whole hour of prayer and maybe you don't need a book, sometimes you spend the entire hour of prayer with a book in front of you. And it's not so much that you're just reading through, you know, page by page, flipping, you know, completing a book. It's more so I can just read a few sentences perhaps, and it's enough to kind of focus my thoughts on Jesus and my mind on something, give me some kind of food in order to digest during that time of prayer. You know, she's she's not speaking of spiritual reading in, in this right. instance. I think that's something entirely different. She would have had a separate time during the day, maybe not every day, to do intentional spiritual reading, to read a spiritual book for the purpose of, you know, comprehending and understanding and, and getting to the end of the book, ideally. I think in this case, it's it's more of an issue of of having something nearby that can aid, aid prayer uh, to bring you sort of through a, a, a distractions or um, whether it be difficulty because you're tired or um, 
other uh, physical distractions, things going on around you uh, in order to kind of keep focused on the intentional act of, of spending time with, with the Lord in prayer. Yeah. Um, so just that distinction between um, spiritual reading and using a book as an aid to, to meditation. Yeah. And then just to like clarify that point, it, the readings that she was doing were probably still spiritual in nature, but she wasn't doing them for the um, intent of developing the intellect and coming to a deeper understanding through study. It was using them as a springboard to focus the prayer life. So, um, and, and I know that that's something that I'm just like within this last season really trying to help develop that distinction because it's really easy to go into prayer with that that spiritual work but then it ends up just becoming a study of that spiritual work and you're not listening to or conversing with the lord in any way you're not developing that relationship with the lord the heart to heart you're only developing the intellect you're just working with your mind and trying to come to a deeper understanding and both are really valuable and both should be done um but there's a time and place for each. And if you are really developing that heart to heart with the Lord, then that's going to inform that study time anyhow. So, right. Yeah, exactly. And you find people kind of err on both sides of that. You'll find some people who think like, well, this is prayer I shouldn't be reading. And so then they'll refuse to have a book and they'll be just suffering through prayer, unable to focus on anything. And then you'll find people on the other side who are just basically spend their entire hour just reading, you know, constantly reading, flipping pages. And, and uh, yeah, the, the trick is to find, really, what is the, the amount that I can read to just nourish my prayer, keep me focused, and and uh, yeah, give me, fr- uh, bring forth fruit in that time of prayer. Right. Mm-hmm. I can, it could be a hard balance. I mean, it took working with a spiritual director this last, the, this last few months to really help me to understand that balance too. So it's, right. if it's something they're struggling with, the struggle's real. <laughs> just <Yes>. struggle on. <laughs> yeah. I have an analogy that I that I've used with uh, with some of the college students that that I've I've worked with um, over the past two summers that I think might be helpful. Um, I think it's help it's helpful for me anyway, and I use it. Um, but it's an analogy of of a backpack, and um, we come to prayer with a heavy load of different intentions, um, prayer intentions to offer to the Lord in prayer for specific people, intercessory prayer. We have um, maybe things that we want to, you know, we find a passage that we're, while we're doing spiritual reading that I want to, you know, go back and bring that into my prayer. So that I have this sort of uh, reading intention that I'm going to bring into my time of prayer. I have my worries. I have my anxieties. Um, I have my just general busyness. Um, and all of that stuff is in a backpack that I'm that I'm wearing and carrying into the into the the chapel for my for my hour of mental prayer, or however long um, we're going to pray. And the the good thing to do with this this backpack full of all these burdens is, you know, when we enter into the into the into the chapel or the church or wherever it is we're going to pray, the Lord just takes that backpack. He knows everything that's in it. He knows all of our intentions all of our intercessions that we want to bring to this time of prayer. He just takes all of it all at once and he hangs it up on a peg and then he wants to spend time with us. Mm-hmm. And if at any point we, we get distracted um, or we lose our focus, then we can go into that backpack and we can pull out that reading. Um, but it's a way to kind of to plan for our time of prayer, to have some sort of uh, plan of action in order to how we're going to spend this time with Jesus. But at the same time, it, it allows him to have the impetus to direct us in the way that he wants us to go for that particular time that we spend with him. So that's my backpack analogy. <laughs> no, it's good. Cause like it's, it. it's like, it's, we don't want to go into prayer with a, this checklist of like, okay, first I'm going to pray the rosary. Then I'm going to do the office of readings. Then I'm going to do some spiritual reading and, and, and feel like we have to complete this checklist in order for the prayer to have been good. When the reality is Jesus mm-hmm. wants to, us to be there with him. Right. You right. wouldn't go if if you were going um, out for a date night with your husband, you wouldn't have that checklist. I know that's some, something that a, a director told me recently. You wouldn't have this checklist of stuff. You're like, OK, first, we're going to look each other in the eye and say how happy we are to be here. OK, next, <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to talk about finances. Then we're going to talk about the kids and then we're going to talk about uh, vacation planning. And then maybe we'll talk about the five year plan and how well we're doing along that process. Like you wouldn't do that. You would just go enjoy spending time with this person. That would terrify any guy. They'd be out of there. <laughs> 
no. And thankfully, oh, yeah. when we do when we do come to prayer, because sometimes you know our hearts are very burdened with different anxieties and worries, um, and you know, thank God that He is so patient with us and that He's able mm-hmm. to withhold and withstand our our uh, attack of of uh, a list of worries and things like that that we want to that we want to bring to prayer. Um, so He's able to work with us, but at the same time, um, we want to be able to work with Him in, in in this time of prayer. Yeah. Well, great. So, uh, is there anything else you have on either of you have on that that uh, that question from Catherine? That's no, that great. was a good question. Was a I appreciate really it. good question. Yeah, yeah, and it, it brought a lot of discussion out. So that that's that's always good as well. Um, so for this episode, uh, you may have noticed if you did the reading beforehand, or if you haven't done the reading, this might be good news for you. Uh, this week's reading wasn't very long, but because it, it covers such a an important topic, we decided to to keep this uh, segment shorter in terms of the amount of reading that we're covering uh, for this episode. So uh, John Mary is going to lead us in just an outline of, of, the, of the reading for today, chapters 22 through 25 of The Way of Perfection. Yeah, so if you'll remember before, the uh, what we were covering kind of right at the very end of the last section was Teresa was like finally getting around. She's like, she's going to teach us about prayer now. And she began that discussion of prayer uh, in the last section on chapter 21, talking about how great determination is needed in prayer. And that's a theme that she's going to continue to come back to throughout this section. So chapter two, 22, Teresa begins by explaining what mental prayer is. And it's such a great, the beginning of that, uh, the description of that chapter in the book is so great because it just says, explains what mental prayer is. And it's just so clear. You're like, yes, finally, here it is. And so Teresa begins that section by explaining, which is something we said a little bit in the last episode, but I think we're going to develop further today, is that vocal prayer and mental prayer must be joined together because we must have an awareness of who it is that we are and who we are speaking to. And so when we recite the rosary or the letter of the hours or any other kind of vocal prayer, Teresa says that we must consider whom we are addressing. And that's a very important aspect uh, for her of prayer. And so vocal prayer and mental prayer are always joined in this this regard. Then Teresa returns in chapter 23 to discussing the, the this need for this determination, or as she calls it, this determined determination. And she explains that there are really three reasons why we need this determination at the beginning when we set out in prayer. Um, one, she says, so we're not like a lender who gives something with the intention of getting it, giving it back. So we should go all in at the beginning saying, Lord, I'm giving this completely to you. Um, so just being very determined and that resolute in your will to give over the time of prayer to the Lord. Um, she explains that it's, it's really very little that uh, we have to give compared to what God gives to us. And we should consider that time of prayer as not belonging to ourselves, but really we owe it to God. But she's not talking about like just missing prayer occasionally or for some just reason or something like that. She explains that, um, which I think we'll go into later, but she talks about how uh, God is not concerned about trifles. Um, but really, yeah, she just she wants us to give, give our wills over completely to God. And the second reason why Teresa explains that determination is really needed is because the devil fears determined souls. If we're not resolute in our desire, then we'll be more often be tempted. And then the third reason why we need to be determined, she says, is that we'll be more courageous and less likely to turn back. And she compares that to like a a soldier in battle who knows that if he's conquered, he will be killed. And so he fights for his life. And then moving on to chapter 24, Teresa continues on this topic of uh, vocal prayer and mental prayer and how they should be joined. And she says that, um, She's speaking to those who cannot tie down their minds in recollection, who just find themselves very distracted. And she says that when we pray vocally, um, we should be refu- refuse to be satisfied with just pronouncing the words. When we say to our Father, it would be a, an act of love to consider who the Father is and who we are. And that prayer ought to be recited in solitude, for we can't Uh, speak both to God and to the world at the same time. And so there are times that we're going to experience distractions in prayer, though, 
and it might be due to ill health or a poor psychological state or perhaps times when God will just allow us to be distracted for our greater good. But Teresa says that we shouldn't think that these, t- these uh, occasions of distraction are our fault and we shouldn't grow anxious over them because that'll just make things worse. Really, all that we should do is um, just do the best that we can in that moment. And then Teresa ends this section of reading on chapter 25, talking about uh, how much the soul gains through the perfect recita- recitation of vocal prayer. And her point here is just that uh, vocal prayer is not some lesser state of prayer in which um, God, or like God isn't, that God isn't pleased with. Vocal prayer joined to mental prayer, she says, is enough to prepare us so that God can raise us up to perfect contemplation, to this pure gift of union with God. And there she goes into a little bit more the distinction between vocal prayer, mental prayer, and contemplation. And she explains that in vocal prayer and mental prayer, uh, we can do something ourselves with the help of God. We speak to him, we think about how great he is and how we can serve him. But in contemplation, she says that we can do nothing. It's just the Lord who does everything in us. And then she explains at the end of that chapter that she's not going to say a lot about contemplation here in The Way of Perfection because she's already written the book of her life and she discusses contemplation a lot there. So she recommends if you want to learn more, hear more what she has to say about contemplation, that you uh, read that book. And that's those those four chapters in a nutshell. And she'll be... She writes another book where she covers that. Yes. Um, the Interior Castle, which she hadn't written at this point, but she will eventually. Uh, and she covers the issue, the issues surrounding uh, contemplation more in detail in in that book, in the in the Interior Castle. Yes. Okay, so brothers, so if you could recommend then, if someone really wants to do more contem- more prayer, ugh, more reading on contemplation, which one of those books should they pick up next? I would definitely say <laughs> to go to the book of her life next. Book of her life next? Okay. Yeah. I, the interior I'm castle. I'm preempting a question. I know people are going to say, well, which one should we do? You right, mentioned two. Right. Yeah. I just find the book of, I know for me, like building a relationship with a saint is so helpful. And I find that the book of her life, you read, you see so much of her personality and build mm-hmm. that relationship. Um, whereas the interior castle, it, I mean, it's charming in its own way, but it's, it's pretty doctrine filled. It's very has a it's a very heavy book, whereas the life I think is more it's auto, it's more autobiographical, which is nice. I yeah, I would definitely say that the life is is easier. It's it's maybe not easy easier to read, but it's because um, I don't think you know it's just it's more um, yeah it's more relatable and it's it flows uh, as you're reading it a little bit easier for you know, a 21st century reader than, than the interior castle would. Yeah. I have a professor who the interior used to castle say, has to be studied. Yeah. yeah. Really. Sorry. No, I was going <laughs> to say, I have a professor who used to say things were tough sledding. If it was a, like a really tough, thick article or something. And I would say the interior castle is tough sledding. Yes. Just, yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks yeah, for no, question. it was it, a very helpful question. Um, so uh, we talked a little bit last time about the differences between mental prayer and vocal prayer. And, and um, I encourage people who want to, to, to review that, to go back to that uh, discussion in episode 31. I think it starts around minute 20-ish of that episode. Um, so there's that there. Uh, but just to say quickly, you know, we're talking about the distinctions in, in these chapters between mental prayer and vocal prayer. Um, and, and Teresa says that, that mental prayer is a necessity. I mean, she goes as far as to say that, uh, but it's important to, to understand why she says that and the context behind why she is so adamant about saying that it's, that mental prayer is a necessity, um, and why she wants people who are engaged in the practice of vocal prayers to join that to the practice of mental prayer. Um, and so brother John Mary, I know you, you have, uh, you had mentioned um, wanting to discuss some of that context. So maybe you could share that now. Yeah, I think, I mean, because wrapped into all this is Teresa's relationship with the Inquisition, which actually there was someone uh, who asked us a question about that from our first episode, 
they were asking whether at a certain point Teresa was uh, poking fun at the Inquisition. Um, and I think, yeah, you can see that several times in Teresa's writing that she is, she does seem to, see, to be critical about some aspects of the, the Inquisition to such an extent that at one point she's writing and the the person who's editing, like censoring her writing, the priest, he writes uh, in, he crosses out a passage and it says, it seems she is reprimanding the Inquisitors for prohibiting books on prayer. So it's like so strong that it was noticeable to, to the censor that he wanted to cross it out. Um, but I think some people can approach this too simplistically and just be like, well, the Inquisition, that, that was totally wrong and like, and not understand where that all of this was coming from because this was a very complex time. The Reformation was happening, and so we saw people going off. This church is really kind of in shambles, breaking off. And so the reaction of the Inquisition, in some sense, I mean, again, we would still say it was wrong, um, but you, it, it's, it was reasonable in the sense that um, what they saw— so, like, for example, they prohibited reading uh, the scriptures in the vernacular— so, you know, people wouldn't be able to just get a Bible in their own language and read it. Well, the reason why wasn't because they disliked, you know, the Inquisition didn't like scripture or something like that. But people who were reading this on their own, uneducated people who weren't being uh, trained to read correctly, were picking up the scriptures, reading it on their own and coming to all these ridiculous conclusions and that were leading them away from Christ and away from the church. And so it wasn't even that the Inquisition didn't want people to read scripture. They did, but they wanted you to read scripture within the context of another book. So like you could buy these devotional books where you'd have quotes from scripture and then they would have an explanation explaining what does this verse mean. So it was this fear really of people reading, yeah, reading the vernacular on their own and coming to false conclusions on their own without the guidance of the church. And particularly women were considered uh, to be um, in danger of this because I think in large part because they were probably, for the most part, uneducated during that time. Um, but also there was this fear that, uh, that a woman's imagination was just so strong that it would kind of lead her off to uh, these false conclusions or to, to thinking they were having like a false vision or that the Lord was leading them somewhere that that he that it when it w really wasn't the case and so what we see along with this is this fear of mental prayer and that's really where Teresa is addressing here there is this fear that especially uneducated women shouldn't be part bar uh, practicing mental prayer because it could lead you astray there is a danger that you could again think that you know you were having a vision and it could lead you to some false conclusions and so Teresa's writing kind of in the midst of that, and basically she's she's disagreeing. She's saying that she thinks that mental prayer is a safe means in order to arrive at union with God. And so that's, I mean, it's a little complicated, but then also on the other side of all of this, you have the Illuminists or the Quietists. And these are people who claimed that contemplation was really the only true prayer. And so any other prayer, like vocal prayer, mental prayer, or even like, you know, the liturgy, they would just reject these things outright, saying that really it was only contemplation. That's the only true prayer. And so you can see, too, how Teresa is really, um, she's insisting on the importance of vocal prayer and, and saying, no, that this is a good means in order to, to achieve contemplation. And it's not that it's not worth anything at all. So Teresa is kind of trying to walk this fine line between the Inquisition, which was always kind of in her mind, so she could, didn't want to like outright attack the Inquisition, but she also wanted to find the, the mean between that and this rejection completely and saying like, well, we shouldn't do mental prayer at all. We should just strive for contemplation. So I don't know if that is helpful, yeah. hopeful, hopefully. And, and to, to make an analogy to, um, you know, the, the invention of, of the printing press in, in Gutenberg and, the introduction of, of vernacular books, books written in, in the local languages of where people, in the languages people speak, um, because so much of the writing had been done in Latin, not just for scripture, but for every, any book you could imagine. It was only in Latin, at least in Western Europe. So the invention of, of these printing presses, it really is, it's the literary equivalent of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and it, it changed the shape of, of history 
the invention of, of being able to reproduce books quickly and inexpensively. It, it changed, it changed everything. So you can see why, you know, there's some growing pains in the church with re regard to reacting towards this, this great development of, of making books available because the people in that time, they, you know, they're, they're suddenly all of a sudden be getting to, to receive, uh, uh, books and reading in a language that they they know and and deal with on a daily basis, and so it's like a, a tsunami tidal wave of information coming into into culture all at once, and so you can understand why the Inquisition wanted to to safely um, consider exactly um, the limits of that and to allow culture and and education to catch up with um with that invention and eventually it happened and you know we don't need an inquisition right. <laughs> anymore thank god um and to say also teresa wasn't afraid of the inquisition and the reason why is because she had such confidence in god that god was leading her mm -hmm. in this way um so you know when she takes little swipes here and there it shouldn't be seen as uh, an irreverence um or a dis disobedience or disloyalty to the uh, hierarchy of the church no, she was she was just uh, utterly confident that God was that God was at work in her. Yes, because she wouldn't have done it otherwise. Right. She she didn't really want to write any of this stuff, yes. uh, and she would have taken the first opportunity and excuse to to give up on it. But because God was directing her specifically um, to do to this, and a lot of a lot of this writing was the result of uh, being obedient to her directors and the Inquisition in order to, to flesh out exactly what, what she, what God was, was teaching to her. Right. Yeah. And so in our reading for this week, we see how, um, Teresa is basically, she's saying that, that it's, it's ridiculous to say that people shouldn't pray, shouldn't practice mental prayer because it, it wouldn't actually be prayer just to recite vocal prayer. So just to, to take up your rosary beads and just to sputter out the words, uh, with no intention of of uniting yourself to God, uh, no intention of who it is you're speaking to. She's saying that's that's not actually prayer, and so we must unite ourselves to God. We must unite um, mental prayer with vocal prayer in order for it to be uh, uh, fruitful. Another aspect uh, that we're encountering for the first time, um, I think, anyway, uh, in in the way of perfection is is dealing with distractions. Um, and, uh, Teresa is really good about this because she knows what it, what it's like, you know, she, she's, she says for herself, um, a few chapters ago that her mind, uh, is at times like a pack of wild horses. Uh, so maybe we should talk a little bit about, uh, dealing with distraction and prayer and also, you know, accepting it at times. Yeah. I know brother John Mary, you mentioned earlier that you know, when you have that vocal prayer, it needs to be tied to the mental prayer. Otherwise, it's kind of useless. But at the same time, maintaining some order and commitment and determination to still practice that prayer, even when it's distracted, is really important. And, it, and it's still beneficial. Um, if, if you're distracted in prayer, yeah, it might be less likely that your vocal prayer will kind of cross over into mental prayer. Um, but it's still good to do. So if the only time you can do your rosary during the day is when you're driving to go pick the kids up from school, it's still beneficial to do it. There's still grace associated with that. Uh, a lot of families try to do a family rosary and that's horribly distracting because half the time you're trying to be like, sit up, sit up, stop picking your nose, whatever. Like, I mean, my kids like to do push ups sometimes during prayer time. I mean, it's very, very distracting time, but it's still good to do. And Sometimes I find that that distracted prayer really instills a deeper desire for that undistracted prayer. Whereas if I were just to say, I'm not going to do it today because things are busy and there's no way I'm going to get to it. Um, that isn't necessarily instilling me like this desire for undistracted one-on-one -on -one time with the Lord to just sit and be with him. But if I, if I do it and I crank it out and yeah, it wasn't the best prayer time, I'm really more determined the next time to really make that a good time of prayer because I miss it. 
so I, I, I want to encourage you that if you're finding that your prayer time is still is distracted, still do it. Don't think, oh, well, it's just not going to be worthwhile. Maybe try to set up the best practices for the least distraction. Like don't try to seek perfection, but there are some things that you can do, like having a routine. If you've got a routine where everybody knows you pray at the same time during the day, then they're going to be less um, apt to distract you when you're doing that. They know, oh, mom's praying right now, or, oh, my roommate always prays between 4 and 4.30 in the afternoon, or my husband always does, you know, whatever at this and this and such time. They're going to know that's their little prayer time. It's not forever. They're going to be done in a couple of minutes. I'll just ask them when they're done. And so I think that if you can get into that routine, then that it might be hard at first, but that helps everybody around you to know what to expect from you and out of you. And that's really, really, really a great thing to be able to do. Yeah, now, that is a really good distinction you made because um, it's, I mean, earlier when you were talking about uh, how doing the prayer anyways, even when it's distracted, because Teresa is not saying like, oh, well, if you can't unite your 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 thoughts all mm-hmm. the time, that it's a waste of your time. What she's really talking about is this idea of going in like without the intention of desiring to think about God or to be with God. She's talking about this kind of like, well, let me just check it off the list mindset. I'm not going to even, I'm just doing this because that's what I do every day. Um, when in reality it's, yeah, it's, uh, the, the, the idea of going into the prayer, like with the desire for that intimacy with God and not finding it is, is God does not depend on us (laughs) in order to give us that grace. Like he can give it if he wants to. So our distractions are not a, don't inhibit God. Yeah, I think there's also a uh, a need to recognize that where what your life looks like during the day might mean that you need to pray differently given the different circumstances of the days. I I've got a friend who's got a bunch of little kids and we were talking this week about her prayer life and she was talking about reflecting on just this vision of the Lord and I mean, it was just so beautiful, but she said she's just been going back to it routinely throughout the week and having such comfort in that vision. And I thought to myself, that is incredible. Like here she is distracted with all these little kids, but if she can just offer her thoughts to the Lord and invite him into a moment while she's washing dishes or while they're outside playing or, um, while they're running around around her, she can, she still has the ability to do that. And, and it's a different type of prayer, but maybe it's, you know, you're just saying Holy Spirit come throughout your day. Maybe it's, it's, you know, Lord Jesus, help me, (laughs) whatever it is, but, and maybe it's carving out the rosary, you know, every morning, uh, time to do that every morning, but not being discouraged when you're, when, when your prayer life doesn't look like you think it should seek other ways to connect through the Lord. If you're saying I can't do the rosary every day, that's okay. What are some other ways that you can connect with the Lord? Because prayer again is about connecting with the Lord in relationship. Like that's what it's about. It's about growing in intimacy with the Lord. We, I uh, have this, this, and I loved your analogy earlier, but I have another analogy. It's not a backpack. It's a screwdriver. So I like to think of my prayer life as a little toolbox. And sometimes I just need the screwdriver. I just need that vocal prayer, that, that, that rosary, that our father, I just need the little screwdriver. And sometimes I need a power drill and I need to just sit in my holy hour with the power drill. And other times it's an electric screwdriver. And it's like that spiritual reading where I just need a little bit of help to focus the prayer, but I'm never only going to need that power drill. Like I'm, I need all three of them in my toolkit. And, and they do the same thing. They both tighten a screw, but they do it differently depending on the circumstance and the situation. And so so that's that's my na- analogy. Sometimes you just need a screwdriver. Well, Dr. Mary Ruth, I, I hate I hate to uh, to burst your bubble, but uh, St. Teresa already came up with a very similar Did analogy. She? Oh my <laughs> gosh. What, well, they didn't have power drills back there. What'd she say? What was her analogy? So, she has the analogy of four ways to water your garden. Oh. Um, and this is called the four waters analogy. And it, 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 it's not in the way of perfection. It's in the book of her life. But okay. it's, it's very similar to okay. what you just described. I just love her. Um, sometimes we need a bucket to, mm-hmm. to carry a bucket up a well and then water the garden. Sometimes we turn a water wheel to bring yeah. water to the garden. Um, sometimes it's just pouring rain, you know, rain from heaven down below. 
So there's uh, these these different uh, ways that that uh, achieve the same right goal, right? Prayer and union with God. So it's it's a really uh, you had a, the intuition. Teresa yeah. speaking through you. And she's the, so and great. The, well, Dr. Mary Ruth, what what is the power drill? I need to get me one of those. I don't have. You don't one of those have in like my... a power drill, like a in... Riabi or a Makita. That was actually the first gift I ever gave no, my husband. In, I'm talking about in my time of prayer. I don't have a power oh, drill. Oh, that's that. Drill. That's that. That's that <laughs> contemplative prayer. That good. Ah. Like he's he's doing all the all the power is coming from somewhere else. Okay. We're not doing okay. anything else. Like the power is from someone else. Yeah. From somewhere else. So, yeah. That nice. contemplative prayer, man. Yeah. And this is reminding me once again of the, the quote, actually, that Pier Giorgio brought up last week, but this quote of St. Thomas Aquinas. I'm going to say it again, just because last week I wasn't sure what you were talking about, Pier Giorgio, but <laughs> this idea of the, the, the force of the original intention in which one sets mm. out praying renders the whole prayer meritorious. And right. so this idea of when we go into prayer with this desire for a time of intimacy with God, even if we're fall asleep the entire hour, even if we're just distracted beyond belief, the force of the orig original intention renders that entire time meritorious. And so we can rest assured. And that's really what Teresa is getting at uh, talking about these distractions is her. She's so wise. I mean, her solution is that we shouldn't grow anxious. Uh, we shouldn't think that the fault lies with us um, and we shouldn't grow anxious because that just makes things worse. Uh, rather we should, just keep striving. Mm -hmm. So true. Yes. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's, uh, you know, uh, distractions are are a factor of of the human condition, and so, um, if if uh, anyone watching or listening is is dealing or particularly frustrated by uh, distractions in prayer. Uh, Know that that me, Deacon Brother Pier Giorgio, is 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 praying distractedly with you uh, throughout the day, and uh, and and there are uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of others who are dealing with the same thing. Um, but the important thing that Teresa wants us to know is to not be discouraged by it and not to give up. Most importantly, don't give up on prayer just because uh, in this moment things are are particularly distracted or your life is particularly anxious or worrisome. Mm keep at it and, and, uh, and stay the course and be determined. Right. I think, and, uh, oh, I was just going to no, say go regarding that determination, I think, you know, at some point she's, I think she says that if, that we should have confidence that if God gives us a de desire, he's also going to give us the grace, right. Um, to achieve or succeed in that, that area of prayer. Um, I, I would caution or, or maybe ask, everybody to sort of think about what is our desire when we go to prayer? Because I know for a long time, my desire was to get it done. Like it was just, it was just to actually spend time in prayer. It, and, and I didn't really think about the fact that it, what my desire should be is closer communion with God. And sometimes that closer communion of God might come because I'm not in that, that time of prayer that I had carved out, but I'm able to still be with him when I'm doing something else that I need to do because our time is not necessarily our own um, as much as we, we want it to be. And so if we can enter into that prayer with a desire to, to simply be closer to the Lord, I think that is, is huge and not to say, well, I want to, um, I want to achieve perfect mental prayer or I want to achieve contemplation or my goal is to like not be distracted in prayer today. No, your goal should be communion with God. And trust and trust that, that God will bring that about because we, so we talked about this last week, but you get so, we get so wrapped up in judging our own prayer mm -hmm. and you're like, Oh, at the end of that hour of prayer, you're like, I didn't feel close to God. And that wasn't a good hour of prayer. It's like no, we have we don't have the the eyes in order to to see even what is a good hour of prayer, and so all we can do is just give ourselves over and trust that if the Lord's giving us allowing us to be distracted, then then that's what He wants for us during that time, and we can just be at peace with that idea. Yes, can I can we circle back to one other thing that um, we had you had mentioned, um, Brother John Mary, you you'd mentioned about the importance about praying in solitude. Yeah, and. Yes, I agree 100% with that statement. And I also think that particularly in family life, it's really beneficial for us to recognize that we um, not only 
should, but like really have an obligation to teach our children what prayer life looks like. And if we're always just running away to do our holy hour in the chapel and not actually ever praying with them or around them, then um, we're missing an opportunity. And so I want to encourage any of the families out there who are struggling through pr family prayer to just to just really persevere and to not see it as wasted time because our children really can and, and that's how they're going to learn how to pray that's how they're going to learn what the elements of prayer are that's how they're going to learn what the vocal prayers are that's how they're going to learn um, that that prayer can and should be a priority it's, it's not by us telling them hey make sure you say your prayers tonight it's by actually sitting down with them and saying prayers um, when they're younger and then helping them to kind of graduate out of that to where we're recognizing that there's an intimacy i know my um, my son is almost 18 and he and I were talking the other day and he said, he's like, mom, my prayer life is between me and me and God. Like it doesn't include you and dad. I don't, <laughs> I don't need to be doing prayers with you every night anymore. And that was such a beautiful statement for him to say to me because it meant you got it. Like you finally got it. This is cool. That's a very, that's what we want, but they're never going to get to that point if we don't teach them what it is initially but we have to make sure that we're not like playing the role of mrs hannigan from annie where we're just like yelling at them all the time because then prayer is not peaceful and that's gonna be something that they hate doing and so just i would just say keep it short but um keep it consistent and keep keep it going um and and if you're struggling ask yourself what are what are your children learning from the time that they spend in prayer with you every family's different and every family's going to organize their prayer time different but be careful that you're not being a hypocrite and make sure that you're you're actually spreading the good news of Jesus Christ as you do this and you're not being sanctimonious instead. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, it's a good clarification actually of what Teresa means when she talks about when she's talking about praying in solitude, she doesn't mean she's interpreting that here in a different way. She's not saying like that means, you know, lock yourself in your room by yourself. She's saying if we invite uh all of our uh, the the mess of the world into our mind in the time of prayer, then then that's not praying in solitude. And what Jesus is asking us to do is to give our hearts solely over to Him, and that's what she means by solitude. Which means we can pray in solitude anywhere, or we can pray with others, and still be praying in solitude. It's just that we're 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 striving after this this intimacy. And I think, like you said, Dr. Mary Ruth, that's that's what we should be doing in prayer, no matter how distracted it is. And that's really how we can model prayer to others, to our to our children, to our families, is by um, they're going to see that solitude and intimacy that we, we're striving to have with the Lord. And that's going to uh, be a model for, for them. The, uh, the last thing that uh, we, I, want, I want us to talk about, and this has been such an, a fruitful discussion, um, is, is determination. And we've, we've hinted at it. Uh, we've been hinting at it for, for the last <laughs> half hour. Um, but to, to just to talk about it specifically, because she mentions uh, in, in these chapters that we we can't be stingy with with what we want to give God in our time of prayer. We have to follow through. And um, as as Brother John Mary mentioned in, in his summary uh, at the beginning of this episode, uh, determination is a, is a powerful weapon against the devil, our enemy, who, who doesn't want us to have a, a union with God, doesn't want us to have a friendship or a relationship with Jesus. Um, and so determination as a, as a weapon is able to keep, to keep the enemy at bay in, in a real and profound way. Um, and so in the, whether it's in the course of, of distractions in prayer uh, whether it, it's in the the fact that we have other people who are praying around us during the time of prayer, or we're praying intentionally with our family, um, don't be discouraged by when things don't go the way that you plan them to be, um, because ultimately, what determination in prayer means is to hand everything over to God uh, for for our time of prayer, and that includes. Um, being consistent about it. Um, and, and Dr. Mary Ruth, you, you said it really well that the, the time, our time is not our own. Um, and once we've, once we've resolved to give time to God in prayer, we should be determined about that and, and, 
and understand it in a way that I've given this time to God um, by by my vows. I've given I've given this time to God for prayer um, by my determination to to be to be a Catholic who prays. I've I've given uh, my time over to God in prayer uh, for prayer. Um, and as St. Teresa says, that the mental prayer is a necessity uh, that we, we need to be doing this. And so to be determined in in taking up, agreeing with her that, yes, this is a necessity for my life as well. And so I'm going to to approach it and engage in it with a determination. And I would say also to 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 add to that, to give the Lord our expectation of that prayer time, too that we don't expect anything out of that time except giving it to him. That's it. We're and, and, and if we end up leaving feeling like we were distracted or it wasn't as great or, or maybe we didn't feel his presence like we wanted to, oh, well, like we gave that time to the Lord to do with as he wants. That's his time with us. One trick that I started using in prayer is I'll take, I do this very often at the beginning of my hour of prayer, I'll ask the Lord, to take any good feelings or consolations that he was planning to give me during that hour of prayer and give it to a loved one of mine, my friend or family member who's most in need of it. And I find that so helpful because then the hour of prayer is over and I've experienced no consolation and I can just be at peace knowing that, that God's used that in a different way. Um, so yeah, it's kind of just a trick that's helped me to go into the time of prayer without expectations. It's like a prayer mm-hmm. hack. Yeah. <laughs> Cheat code. That could be our that could be our new YouTube channel, Prayer Hacks. <laughs> Prayer Hacks. We could, for we the could get a great Mary. a clickbaity sort of uh thumbnail too. Oh, I, I I wanna share a story uh that happened to me um just in relation to determination, uh because this is a very very important um you know, people who, who know and study Teresa well know how important this idea of determination is. And I'm sure you'll see that as we continue throughout this season. Um, but there's this, this, this funny little phrase that she, it's even funny how she says it, uh, determinada determinacion, so determined determination. Isn't that a, a, a tautology, I guess would be the word for it. Um, but, but what does that even mean to be, de- we have to be determined about our determination, right? So this is a, it's kind of a funny little thing. And that's, that's just how important it was. Um, and I remember it was, uh, this was Brother John Mary when we were, when we were at the, living in the monastery in Oregon, um, the first day of, we have something called a second novitiate where we, we spend three months, uh, in preparation for our solemn vows. And I was doing this, uh, in the fall of 2019 and the very first day of my, my second novitiate, we had this special mass, um, where an archbishop was, was present in celebrating mass. Um, for the, the Benedictine community that, that was were our neighbors. And uh, so we went to this mass and uh, I, I was I was praying uh, in the church after mass and I got up from the from the pew and the archbishop who had just celebrated mass was right there. And I'll never forget this. He, he said to me, brother, determinada determinacion. <laughs> <laughs> and which is direct comes direct. He knew I was a discalced Carmelite, and he knew that Saint Teresa was was my was the foundress of my religious order. And uh, it was such an appropriate, both uh, in providential time, for him to say that, but also what an, an appropriate thing to say as well as I was engaging in this this extended three month long preparation for my for my solemn vows of giving my life entirely to God in, in solemn profession. Um, so I have to share that story because it's it's really I. I I think about it often. Oh, he also gave me a hug too, which was which was very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's good. Well, anyway, um, is there anything else that we want to that we want to wrap up with uh, on our discussion of these chapters? Um, I know that Dr. Mary Ruth, you have our weekly wrap up thought to take home for everybody who's watching and listening I as do. well. But is there anything before that? I have a little shout out actually to someone who DM'd me on Instagram, which I just love it when people reach out to me on Instagram. That's kind of the platform that I'm on way too much. So I love like connecting with people over there. But to Allison of Humble Beads Mission, I just loved her message. And she and her six-year-old daughter have been listening to these or watching them. And um, they're just finding, they're both finding it super helpful. So I just love to say thank you for reaching out to us and letting us know when you guys like something. 
Yeah, and thank and you for yeah. thank you to all of our listeners. It's it's really great yeah. to get your feedback and encouragement and questions and all of that. It really it helps us, I think, to to uh, be more determined as we go. It about does. This point. It really, really does. And then I do have a call to action. I want everybody to think about: Are they distracted in prayer this week? Not while they're in prayer, though. Okay, don't be thinking about whether you're distracted when you're actually in prayer. But when you're not in prayer, um, try to evaluate whether your distractions are internal or external. And if they're external in nature, um, try to set up your routine so you're less likely to be distracted. Make sure you eat a little something before you go in. Make your expectations clear to those people around you. Have it be a consistent prayer time, all those things. And then um, be determined in that um, time and be um, really honor that that time and then um, because the more determined you are the more determined the other people around you will be to honor that time as well Um, and then if they're internal direction in if they are internal distractions I want to encourage you to say the Saint Michael the Archangel prayer Um, and don't worry too much because I mean even Saint Teresa got Uh, distracted in prayer. Even Pierre Giorgio is getting distracted in prayer, right? So we all get distracted. Just don't get distracted by the distractions. Just keep bringing yourself back to the Lord when it happens. Like out of your mind, back to the Lord. Get it out of your mind, get back to the Lord. So that's it. That's all I got. Excellent. That's great. Yeah. St. John Paul II loved the St. Michael the Archangel prayer. And he was, he was a, uh, he, he desired to be a Carmelite friar himself but God had other plans for him. Um, so we definitely in, encourage, encourage the, the prayer to, to St. Michael as a way to, to uh, defend ourselves against mm-hmm. the attacks of the enemy um, and attacks against our determination, right? Yeah. So I just want to remind everybody to please send in your questions about this or any of our episodes uh, to our email address at carmelcast at icspublications.org. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, just drop down to the comments and uh, and give us a question, give us a, a hello, and uh, and we will we will be looking at all of those before our next episode. Uh, which, by the way, uh, episode 33 of Carmelcast will be over chapters 26 to 31 of the Way of Perfection. So thank you all very much, and God bless you. Hey everyone, Brother Pier Giorgio here. Thanks for checking out this episode of CarmelCast. If you want to hear more of us, don't forget to click subscribe. Also, be sure to click like if you enjoyed this episode, and maybe even leave us a comment. We post discussion questions down below to get the conversation going. Want more information on Carmelite spirituality and the Discalce Carmelite Saints? Then you'll want to check out our website, www.icspublications.org. There's a link in the description of this episode. From here, you can see all our current promotions and access our complete catalog for the writings of St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Therese of Lisieux, St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, and St. Edith Stein. If you want to stay up to date on all our promotions and new titles, then be sure to add your email to our email list. There's no better way to stay up to date on the latest Carmelite publications. Thanks for joining us, and may God bless you.